and welcome to everyone today. My name is Elizabeth Smith. I'm the current board president of ASSIST, and we're so glad that you've joined us for this ASSIST community conversation this month. It's on a topic that we're so excited to be um, bringing out to our experiencer community, uh, the topic of psychedelics and uh, spiritually transformative experiences. For those of you that are not familiar with ASSIST, this stands for the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. And we have a twofold mission. The first uh, part of our mission, which is really the whole reason we exist, is to educate and support experiencers about what a spiritually transformative experience is and support and educate them in a way that they can empower themselves to integrate those experiences communicate about those experiences with their family and friends in a way that will hopefully create more unity and understanding for everyone. And our other mission is, our, our, the second part of our mission, I should say, is to educate and support mental health professionals who might be working with people who've had spiritually transformative experiences. So I'd like to introduce our executive director today. Her name is Katrina Michelle. She's a holistic psychotherapist practicing in New York City. Katrina, welcome. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited about today's conversation. It seems like uh, psychedelics have been part of the background here at ASSIST, and this is the first time that we're formally introducing them to the conversation. And I think they're so important to talk about because they are becoming uh, more mainstream in the way that research is being uh, conducted right now and the experiencers that are coming forward as a result of their um, experiences with psychedelics. So I'm excited about the panel we have here today and I'm excited for those of you who are joining us live, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of the panel uh, toward the end of our broadcast. And I'd like to begin with some introductions. So uh, Dr. Alex Belser, let's begin with you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, you can take a couple of minutes to uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what's influenced you and your work as a psychedelic researcher and perhaps what projects you're currently working on. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and uh, uh, Richard and Ingmar. It's really lovely to be here today and to speak with everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm dialing in from Brooklyn. It's a rainy day outside, but uh, the, the first days of spring are upon us and it's, it's a, there's a feeling of a new promise uh, on, in the city. Um, I am a, a clinical research fellow at Yale University. Uh, I work primarily actually out of New York, not out of New Haven. Uh, and I also, um, and at Yale, I, I uh, teach psychotherapy and super, do, I'm a clinical supervisor, primarily working actually with studies uh, for LGBTQ youth and adults to develop affirming therapies for them. But I'm also a co-investigator of a um, trial looking at uh, treating obsessive compulsive disorder with psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. The uh, primary investigator there is Dr. Ben Kalmendi. Uh, and in New York, uh, I teach at NYU in the graduate program in uh, counseling, um, where I, I teach psychotherapy coursework uh, with Ingmar, who's our, uh, our lead and our in primary investigator here in New York. I'm a study therapist for a large national trial looking at uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. This is MDMA and Molly ecstasy and sort of uh, underground settings, but uh, this is MDMA-assisted therapy for the treatment of severe PTSD, um, and it's, a, it's lovely to work with Ingmar uh, on that trial. And um, my background is I started getting involved with psychedelic research in the late 90s when I was an undergraduate, uh, and uh, at the time there was almost no um, uh, clinical research happening. We were sort of in a dearth of research. Uh, it was very difficult to conduct research and expensive. Uh, it wasn't really until 2006 when Johns Hopkins started coming out with some publications. Uh, we began a trial at New York University School of Medicine at Bellevue Hospital where we treated people with cancer and cancer-related uh, existential distress. These are people with clinically elevated levels of depression and anxiety and dealing with issues of death and dying. Uh, we treated them with uh, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, and I can explain more what that means. Um, 
So that trial wrapped up um, many years ago, but at NYU, we now have a number of trials, including uh, a, a trial to look at the treatment of addiction, specifically uh, alcohol addiction with psilocybin and, and psychotherapy. And I'm also, um, my specialty has really been in interviewing our, our clients, our patients, the study participants. So we have a, a, what's called a healthy normal study with uh, religious professionals. These are individuals who are uh, religious leaders in their own communities of faith uh, and service. And so these are priests, clerics, imams, Zen teachers. Um, they don't qualify for any DSM diagnoses, but they, uh, uh, we, we offer them psilocybin and supportive psychotherapy. Uh, and I've been interviewing them in depth about their experiences, along with interviews with our cancer patients. Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of my quick background. It's really lovely to be here. On the side, I, I, I speak and write a little bit about psychedelic mysticism and comparisons between spiritual experiences that um, are occasioned through non-psychedelic means, whether they're spontaneous or through some other um, act of God or experience uh, as compared to psychedelic experiences that occur, uh, rather religious, spiritual, or mystical experiences that are occasioned by the use of a psychedelic plant. Uh, or medicine. Uh, so I'd be happy to share a little bit about that um, as well. Uh, thank you for having me. That's great. Thank you so much for being with us. And it really sounds like you're involved in every crevice of this research. So I'm excited for all that you can speak to about this. Thank you. And Dr. Ingmar Gorman, welcome. And thanks for being with us. Uh, please share a little bit about you and your journey and your current research. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you uh, for having me, and also hello to, to Alex and Richard. It's nice to see you. <laughs> um, so I'm calling also from New York. Uh, this is actually, I'm in the office at the Center for Optimal Living, which is um, the home of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program, which is the program that I direct. It's one of the roles that I have uh, in, this, uh, in this field or in this space. Uh, so I could say a little bit about, about that. Um, so we, it, listening to Elizabeth's description of, of your organization, it actually sounds very similar to uh, some of our goals and missions. So we do focus particularly on the psychedelic experiences, um, but we're very interested in educating mental health professionals uh, on the topic of psychedelics, in particular preparing uh, uh, mental health professionals for a client who may come into their office and express an interest in having a psychedelic experience or having had one and now needing support processing that experience, essentially uh, helping maximize the benefits and reduce the harms as it relates to, to psychedelics. So that is one arm of the psychedelic education continuing care program is education, but we also offer individual uh, therapy and consultation with people who are coming in to see us for support around their psychedelic experiences, uh, as well as particular groups uh, focused on topics such as psychedelics and trauma or psychedelics and exploration or um, ketamine integration. And, um, and so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a psychologist uh, trained in clinical psychology uh, here in New York. And um, I'm also a postdoctoral um, fellow at NYU at their School of Nursing in their behavioral sciences training, um, looking at substance uh, abuse. So much of my training background, training experiences has to do with uh, substance misuse or substance use. And so um, in that way, I see there's sort of a, some overlap. And of course, we don't necessarily automatically consider psychedelic use to be misuse, uh, but uh, I do find it helpful to um, have that kind of background in order to speak to professionals about the differences between the two, use and misuse, um, as well as sometimes some of the um, kind of addiction type ex um, difficulties that people sometimes uh, are seeking psychedelics for, in other words, to address alcohol use or some behavioral uh, addictions. Um, I'm also, uh, as Alex had mentioned, the uh, co-principal or post-site principal investigator on a study of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we're known as the private practice site here in New York because there's also a site at NYU. Uh, and there we are treating severe PTSD. And that's a study that is, just to add on to what Alex has already said, that's a study that is funded by MAPS, 
which is a nonprofit organization. The uh, stands for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, which is an organization that's focused on in investigating the potential of uh, psychedelics to treat um, and, and cannabis to treat various uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, I began my uh, interest in this area uh, in the mid 2000s. I was living in Prague at the time and there's a very rich history of psychedelic uh, research particularly with LSD, psilocybin and mescaline that goes uh, back quite far and uh, I was sort of plugged into that history and um, then as an undergraduate a few years later some of the work that I've done was to look at uh, the, the what is called, um, or what we called, uh, autognostic or autodidactic experiences with psychedelics by mental health professionals. So what we did was a sort of a 60-year follow-up study, looking at mental health professionals who had their own experiences, particularly with LSD, during the period of about 19, um, the late 1940s to uh, the um, uh, mid-1970s. And uh, we were interested in seeing how uh, they, what they learned from their experiences. And if that's something we wanted to talk about at a later point, that's something I can bring up. Um, so I think that's it for my, uh, my roles. Uh, and again, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and discuss this topic with you. Beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, and again, it's so exciting to hear about all the different research that's happening. So great that you're involved in so much. Uh, and Dr. Richard Knowles, thanks for being with us. Please share a little bit about yourself and uh, your current research. Sure, so um, I'm a licensed psychologist with about 11 and a half years of experience in mental health care and psychotherapy. I help clients uh, integrate spiritual experiences, including psychedelic ones, whenever folks come to me with those kinds of problems. And um, I'm looking forward to setting up an expanded access clinic for treating PTSD with MDMA here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I've been worked, or I've worked at um, Sophia University as associate core faculty. It, it used to be known as the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, and it was co-founded by Jim Fadiman, who many of you may know is um, uh, pretty popular in this psychedelic community. And in recent years, he's been uh, advocating microdosing of psychedelics. And I've worked for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic St Studies since 2014 as an adherence rater and trainer. So uh, what that entails is watching the therapy sessions uh, unfold and then rating the therapist based on uh, a series of protocols that are used by MAPS to ensure uh, quality of care and, and, and consistency as well. I did a postdoc at the Transformative uh, Tech Lab where I studied technological ways of exploring consciousness. And uh, I'm also the founder and executive director of Dela Psyche Research Group, which is now in partnership with the Beckley Foundation, which has a long history of um, exploring and researching psychedelics. And uh, they are UK based. And um, I've made contributions to parapsychology in an ESP, ESP study on the use of electromagnetic shielding on psi expression. And uh, currently I'm principal investigator for two research projects, one on the uh, psychological effects of microdosing psychedelics and the other on a vibroacoustic therapy technique using Japanese kotodama sounds, uh, which is sacred in their Shinto tradition. And I've had a lifelong interest in spiritual experiences and higher states of consciousness and consciousness studies. And I look forward to making further contributions in these fields in upcoming years. So that's pretty much me. <laughs> it's glad, I'm glad to be here. This is a wonderful experience to be a part of. We are happy to have you here. Um, All right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are so many topics we can get into just based on the research you are all involved in alone, but um, we're here to talk about spiritually transformative experiences, so let's start there. Um, we know that all psychedelic experiences are not necessarily spiritually transformative, and it assists we really focus on servicing uh, folks who have had spiritually transformative experiences, and often that does happen through psychedelics. So if you would, based on your experience um, working with people clinically and in research, I would love to hear what your thoughts are about um, psychedelics and spiritually transformative experiences coming up 
as a side effect or a benefit of um, the work. So who would like to begin? Um, well, I'd be happy to begin just with a short, I think it'd be good to kind of um, discuss the different contexts in which spiritual experiences can happen. Um, and this is speaking mostly from the perspective of outside of the clinical trials, because I think, just to say briefly about the clinical trials, with psilocybin, I think the spiritual experience is often seen as uh, a main effect. And um, within the trials with MDMA, uh, it's certainly considered to be uh, a piece of the, the treatment. Um, outside of the clinical trial context, though, um, I've mentioned this because we know that people are. Um, using psychedelics with multiple kinds of intentions, right? Sometimes um, it is for healing and people are aware of the spiritual dimensions of that healing process. Uh, sometimes it can be for uh, um, recreation. And, and I like to take a moment to just say what, I talk about recreation, that I, that I looked into sort of the etymology of it and you know, it comes from renewal, right? So I, or to recreate. So I don't use recreation in a pejorative sense. Um, I think there's, there can be space for recreational use of psychedelics, thinking about it in that sense. However, I don't advocate for that, but I want to make sure that we are understanding that. So sometimes people are going into a psychedelic experience um, with an intention to have a, say, an entertaining or fun time, uh, and something spiritual may occur that they were not expecting. Um, and then there are also, uh, now I think with maybe greater frequency, anecdotally, people are hearing about the, um, the potential positive uh, mental health benefits of psychedelics, uh, yet are not anticipating the depth or intensity of the kind of spiritual experience that can emerge. And uh, that's sometimes when people are reaching out to the psychedelic program for support mental health support, it is because uh, they uh, didn't quite um, expect to have the experience that they had, and it's a little bit overwhelming for them. And then that kind of expresses itself as anxiety or in various forms of physiological symptoms, and that's when we're intervening. So I just wanted to kind of add that to maybe frame the discussion a little bit. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And it's interesting to hear about the intention with the different types of substances uh, being studied and, and that the spiritual uh, event is actually what we're looking at for the transformation uh, in the research itself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gorman. Um, Alex or Richard, would you like to comment on this? Sure, I can go next. Um, from what I've heard about um, and read about how this happens, how um, psychedelics can precipitate spiritually transformative experiences. There's a couple of neurological things that are going on in the brain at the time these experiences are happening. And uh, there's a, a, a network in the brain called the default mode network that gets mostly dis deactivated by the serotonergic psychedelics um, by hitting 5-HT2A receptors that are uh, mostly found within the default mode network. And so the default mode network is basically responsible for your personal sense of self and how the self relates to the world and it has access to your own personal memories and everything. And for instance, people with depression have an overly active default mode network because they're constantly telling themselves negative thoughts about themselves and how their selves relate to the world. And um, people who meditate more often typically have a lowered activity of the default mode network. So what happens with these serotonergic psychedelics is they bombard the default mode network with so much activation that it basically just shuts down and can no longer operate properly. And therefore the ego goes offline. And while this is happening, uh, other networks of the brain that don't normally talk to each other because they're so busy integrating usually with the default mode network, they begin to actually talk to each other. So this is likely where we get um, lots of experiences of d divergent and convergent thinking, which is what we might consider to be creativity. There may be archetypal kinds of uh, experiences that come up. Uh, because of uh, the various uh, networks that are not normally talking to each other, um, talking to each other at this point in time. And 
a lot of subconscious material that normally would be suppressed uh, begins to come up. And I, I believe this is why psychedelics have been so very effective in psychotherapy because issues that are normally submerged beneath layers of defense mechanisms are suddenly exposed and right there out in the open, which can be a very challenging process if, if you're basically forced to go through some of these experiences to, to uh, process them. But I think like with proper psychotherapeutic care or even with like a, a very well experienced sitter, uh, it, it, it can, a lot of positive and benefits can come out of this. Like clearing away um, old traumas and old uh, issues that have rested beneath the surface for quite some time. I, I like to use um, a mountain metaphor, and this isn't mine, and many other people have used this, but let's say that you've taken a significant dose of psychedelics and you're sort of metaphorically traveling up the mountain. The closer you get to the top, you're going to have more and more archetypal kinds of experiences which could be of, you know, entities and gods, goddesses, things like this, or um, um, just kinds of archetypal expressions of, of experience, of human experience. And the closer you get beyond that, it gets a bit more and more alien and then um, encompassing more and more things until it's like the ultimate archetype, which is absolute existence, like timeless existence, which paradoxically creates time as well. And then you start coming down the mountain and you get back into the archetypal experiences and those fade and then eventually you come back down to normal reality. So um, I think that's a pretty decent metaphor for what goes on, probably not just with psychedelic experiences, but uh, I would tend to think that with, with some normal uh, non-psychedelic mystical experiences as well. Well, it's really fascinating. Thanks for breaking that down the way you did. It really helped my understanding. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah, as someone who's not particularly understanding all the science of it, it's really helpful to understand how all of this uh, works. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're welcome. So, Alex, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah. I. Uh, Well, first of all, let me just bring in, if it's okay, some of the voices of our, of our patients, of our participants in the psilocybin trial. Uh, so this is a study that we finished a few years ago, but um, I entered, did in-depth interviews with some of our cancer patients. These are people with various stages of cancer throughout their body. Some were in remission, some were currently uh, dealing with some of the difficulties of chemotherapy. And um, what... Uh, we did was we interviewed them about their experience. And I just wanna read some of their um, words because I think it'll help sort of sow the field a little bit uh, regarding their ex the nature of their experiences. So uh, if that's okay, um, here's just an excerpt from, I'll read from four different people's experiences. Uh, this was a middle-aged woman uh, with a type of uterine cancer. She said, at some point I just started feeling love, just overcome with love, and all the love that I have for my family and my friends. I, I felt that it was coming from them also. I felt that I was bathed in it. And if I were religious, it definitely, it would have been a religious experience. I would have said bathed in God's love. And I don't think English really has a way to say this without using the word God. Um, maybe bathed in transcendent love, bathed in universal love. It was such a strong feeling. Another participant said, and these are a little bit shorter, you just see with your own eyes that that's what happens after you lose your body, that there is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, this is a, a younger man. Uh, he said, how do you explain infinity? What do I tell you? What word do you want me to use to explain infinity? Because that is what I am feeling. I am experiencing infinity. And uh, this was a, a woman in her 60s. She said, I felt a kind of joy and sorrow all at once. It probably looked more like sorrow, but sorrow has never been so beautiful because it is indescribable, because it's of the highest calling, the highest calling, gratitude, gratitude for life. And I, I'm sort of cherry picking here, but I have similar quotations from all of more than a dozen participants that I sat down with in this trial. And we, we hear similar things from the religious leaders 
uh, who often reflect that they change their sermonizing, the way they speak with their, their patients. Oftentimes, uh, I spoke with uh, uh, an Orthodox uh, priest who was, was speaking very much in doctrinal ways in his work with his uh, community. And he said in the last year and a half since taking psilocybin, it's a fairly moderate to high dose of psilocybin in a supportive context with two therapists. He said that he changed the nature of his sermon to talk about love. And it was something that he felt uncomfortable speaking about before, but he had an experience of God's love that felt transformative for him in a way that he could share it with his community. And I think what's confusing about psychedelics, both theoretically and phenomenologically, is that there's this whole like multiple theological traditions and spiritual traditions around trying to understand what happens when people have a religious, spiritual, or mystical experience. They're very difficult to study, right? Like even if you study things like NDEs, near-death experiences, you have to get after the fact accounts from people. People write journals and tell you what they saw, what happened to them. People who are in car crashes or who have spontaneous experiences, you might interview them afterward. What's different about some of the psychedelic medicine work we're doing is that these are substances, medicines that have been used in indigenous rituals on the six inhabited continents of the earth for, as far as we can tell, many centuries or millennia. And they, it's, what's interesting is that they reliably, in many clients, not all clients, but in many clients, produce or occasion a mystical experience. How do we know it's a mystical experience? It's a very difficult question. And, you know, we can go back to the work of W.T. States, who said we have to be indifferent to the cause of the experience. Like, how do we know if, uh, you know, uh, Ingmar says he has a religious mystical experience and Richard says he has one and I say they have one, who's the person who's actually having the authentic, genuine, real McCoy and who's doing something else? And what Stace says is that we have to be indifferent to the causes uh, and that if people describe the phenomena in a way that is compelling, that sounds real, and is indistinguishable from other people's experiences, then we should be open to the possibility that they've had a, a, an authentic and real experience. And this also harkens back even further to the father of psychology, William James, who he himself had what he describes as, as a spontaneous mystical experience while walking in the Adirondacks in the forest. He sort of fell down and had this uh, nature mysticism, mysticism experience where he felt at one with the plants and with the earth and with the air. Uh, but he says that we should judge these experiences when he studied the lives of Christian mystics in the Middle Ages, for example, that we should judge these experiences uh, not, by, not by their roots, but by their fruits. Meaning, you know, whether the person was an ascetic and arrived at an experience of God through biting insects and ascetic practices of praying for many, many hours a day, or whether they were Teresa de Avila and had an erotic transfiguration of God that was almost libidinous in her descriptions of it, or whether they were have a more pious experience of a, a saintly experience of the divine, that we should judge their experience as to be authentic based upon who they were, how they walked in the world, what the fruits of their experience in terms of their preaching and their work uh, with the people with whom they came into contact with. And I think today we're struggling to make sense of these psychedelic experiences because the discourse around them is highly medical. There's a good reason for that. The generation of knowledge is, uh, is shaped by uh, randomized controlled trials and scores on religious questionnaires like the Hood Mysticism Scale and the Mystical Experience Questionnaire and the Beck Depression Inventory. And you know we're interlocuting not only with other practitioners but with the DEA and the federal, uh, the FDA and with uh, you know uh, scientific organizations. And so that discourse doesn't really have a lot of space for some of the patient accounts that we actually hear. Um, and I think that the work of ASSIST and sort of the discourses that are happening here may really help us uh, think more broadly about uh, what, what is happening when people take a medicine into their body in a context like this. Um, and it's, as a clinician and as somebody who works with these patients, but also somebody who interviews with them, it's, it's quite, I have to admit, I mean, it's really quite compelling to sit with them. Um, and, I, and I know Richard and, and Ingmar could speak to this because I, there's a, uh, a depth of connection that's quite different and feels quite different than working oftentimes with 
um, clients in my private practice during doing more conventional um, psychotherapy. Um, if it'd be okay, I'd like to just build off a few things that Alex had said. Um, one, I just want to reiterate, I'm so happy that I have Alex and Richard here. <laughs> For Richard to, to speak eloquently about the default mode network and, and Alex really to capture the qualitative real experiences. I think it's, as he has said, it's difficult to convey um, through words. And uh, I just really want to appreciate Alex's ability to kind of sum up the complexity of, of all of this. Um, I, to build off of what Alex had said, um, you know, a good good kind of uh, example of what captures captured this, um, I guess, friction uh, or tension in the the mystical um, experience or spiritual experiences. I don't know where we are right now in terms of academia on this topic, but I know that in the mid late two thousands, when publishing about psilocybin, uh, the uh, Articles had to be written with the phrase mystical like experience, not not mystical experience uh, induced by psilocybin, but mystical like. And uh, my understanding of that reasoning was this idea that um, because it was something that was induced by substance, it wasn't a mystical experience. It was something like a mystical experience. But uh, of course, this very much goes against sort of the quote that uh, or, that or the thought that Alex shared with us about the the source. You know, what is the source of that? Um, I, I would I would say my opinion is that they're sort of indistinguishable from each other. Something that's spontaneously induced uh, or induced through other means or through a substance like um, like means. Um, and and maybe just to also bring in um, Richard, you had mentioned your work as a um, a raider um, looking at the MDMA therapy, and uh, one of uh, I haven't looked at those uh, the rating scale for a while, but one of the things that um, is involved in the MDMA therapy is both uh, preparing uh, participants who may never have had a spiritual experience about the possible effects of the MDMA, and that that may include experiences that are not ordinarily um, they're not ordinary. And also uh, uh, the validation of these experiences afterwards. Some people, um, even though they have the experience themselves of something that may be transcendent or uh, a deeply sense, sense, a felt sense of love or infinity, there can be a tendency for some people to sort of dismiss that or contextualize it as, oh, that was a drug experience and it wasn't real. So we are sort of we're kind of working with that in, in the therapy. Um, I don't know, Richard, if you have anything that you'd like to to add from your work um, observing that. Yeah, so uh, in the rating process, the protocol, um, it has a number of different factors in it, and I, I don't have them all memorized, but th they're very keen to not dismiss any kind of transpersonal experiences that might happen. And they use general terms like transpersonal to cover like a wide umbrella of, of various experiences that, that uh, could possibly happen including you know very um deep senses of, of uh, deep feelings of love and usually mystical experiences don't uh happen with mdma unless you mix it with something else but like like lsd or something like that but um anything transpersonal that comes up is honored and respected in the protocol for adherence rating yeah I think it's really important too. I mean, there's been uh, enough studies that have said that um, transpersonal experiences, especially the mystical experiences, are directly related to uh, the beneficial outcomes that people experience, um, w whether it's depression or end of life anxiety and things like that. So it looks like some sort of moderating factor. Yeah. Did you want to hear about anything else, or did I answer your question? Is that all right? You did, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I I really appreciate that that insight, and there's so much there to unpack about the unique experiences people are, people are having and how we understand them in the context of the research and what the initial goals are going into the research and what the outcome is. Um, yeah, it just seems like endless streams of information. You know, since it came up with Alex, I am curious to ask about your personal experiences sitting with people and how that has perhaps impacted you and your own understanding of all of this. Does anyone want to speak to that? 
I, I think we all do. <laughs> I'd be surprised if, if, if um, I, I guess what I'll say very quickly is that, um, you know, I dedicated uh, my life to this work. Uh, I've now it's been 14 or 15 years since I decided that this is something that I'm going to do. And it really wasn't until last year that I um, had my first opportunity to uh, facilitate an MDMA assisted psychotherapy session with somebody. And I will say that, you know, if sort of 14 years of buildup of anticipation and, and work, and um, I will say that I was, um, not only were sort of my, um, I guess, expectations met, but they were far, far exceeded. I mean, and this really speaks to what, what Alex had mentioned about um, what it is like to sit and facilitate this process, both before, during, and afterwards. I mean, I really think that it is trans absolutely transformative for us as people who are sitting and, and uh, observing this incredible, uh, is incredible, uh, incredible process. Uh, and to maybe specify that a little bit more, what I think I'm most astounded by is um, the, the truth, um, the personal truths that people are able to access with, um, you know, I, I think the support of the therapists is important that we're there to uh, be, be there for safety, um, uh, to, to be a container, a witness to the experience, but so much of that, that truth uh, finding uh, or experiencing is, is done almost entirely by the participant. And it's, it's uh, absolutely remarkable to, to observe. And it's, it's extremely, um, for, for me personally, gratifying to, to be a witness to that process. Thanks, Ingmar. Uh, Alex or Richard, do you have any thoughts on your own personal experience and your way of supporting others in their journeys? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, um, I mean, culturally, we're dealing with collective trauma in a variety of ways, uh, specifically the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And much of the work that MAPS is doing is sponsoring work around PTSD and uh, about half of, if not more, of uh, the people in those trials have combat trauma experience. Um, so I, I, my co-therapist is a psychologist who uh, works at the, vet the VA here in Manhattan, specializes working with vets, and we recently worked uh, in the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy trial for severe PTSD with a, a, a middle-aged man who um, had quite a bit of severe trauma in one of those wars. Uh, he had seen I mean, he'd been really been in the shit, you know, he'd, he'd seen, um, he was infantry and had seen uh, more than 20 different firefights had been pinned down, had called in, uh, raids had been in close hand to hand combat using firing his pistol, uh, had made kills, his friends and people wh whom he, uh, commanded had been killed. Um, it, it was really astounding. I mean, one of the things when you, uh, Di make a diagnosis for a study of PTSD is you have to have the index trauma, which is like the trauma. There could be other traumas, but the index trauma in Criterion A says it's okay, this is the, the thing that they're having is most relevant to their current experience of avoiding and flashbacks and hyper arousal. And we had difficulty sort of nailing that down because he just, we learned about an experience and we sort of put that down as the index trauma. And I think that was sufficient for the purpose of the study. But then in the trial, and maybe I can walk people through what this looks like, um, in most of these trials, at least for the MDMA trial, the person comes in, there's lots of initial screening and tests and medical workups, uh, and then they get uh, three sessions of psychotherapy with a therapy team of two therapists. Uh, so they're always with two therapists, which is a unique feature of a lot of these, this work. Uh, these three sessions of psychotherapy are long. They're double sessions, they're 90 minutes. You know, we sort of take a full history, talk about the trauma, uh, and the whole point is to develop trust and rapport in the room. Uh, and if we, for any reason, feel like this person does not have a sense of safety or a safer sense that they could do psychedelic MDMA work, then we might delay. Uh, but then, structurally, they, they have these preparatory sessions, three of them, and then there are over three months have three different MDMA sessions. Uh, and so these, we call them day-long sessions, but they come in usually on a Saturday and take the medicine with us and are, are done with their journey by around five o'clock. And they, 
we, ha we actually ask them to spend the night. In between these sessions, we have integration sessions. So there's, there's three sessions of integration, each 90 minutes long after each of the three sessions. So the whole treatment takes, the basic thrust of the treatment is a little over four months, and then there are long-term follow-ups uh, for assessments. Uh, so it's a very intensive treatment. I mean, there's, um, you know, you're talking about over 80 hours of clinician's time, um, uh, and it's a very expensive treatment in some ways. Uh, but what's interesting about the recent findings is that for, um, you know, for uh, the, the MDMA studies, there was a recent comparison of three different studies treating people with PTSD with MDMA. This is 107 participants, uh, so over 100 people treated, and in a 12-month follow-up, two-thirds of the, the people, that's 68 percent, uh, had remission in their treatment-resistant PTSD, which, as you know, PTSD is very difficult to treat, and so when you have 68 percent remission, not just response, but people who no longer met criteria, criteria for PTSD, it's really quite an astounding finding. It's one of the reasons why the FDA named this a, a breakthrough therapy, it gave it a breakthrough status designation, which eases some of the regulatory considerations and puts it on a bit of a faster track uh, for consideration as a treatment. Being in the room with the person, you know, this gentleman who had done, had all this combat experience, he, I mean, one of the things with MDMA is that it, uh, it suspends the amygdala function. We could think about it from a biomechanical aspect, but his trauma narrative was looping and looping and looping. And anytime he would uh, approach something that was a memory of a dissociation or an event, uh, it would be so scary that he would dissociate out and go back into a trauma narrative of being hypervigilant, scared, avoidant, and, and also depressed and dysphoric oftentimes. But with the MDMA and because he felt safe with, with me and my co-therapist, or safe enough, uh, he, he went to work. I mean, he just really, like, for six straight hours, recounted to us the depth and with specificity his memory of the trauma, his memory of the people that he had killed, his memory of being shot at. And um, so that trauma loop that was, like, sort of getting caught up, he started, he started to go out of that and and just revisited these traumas over and over again and kept on going out of it and then returned back to childhood trauma and neglect which hadn't really come up at first but early experiences of really profound violence and neglect from his parents and his mother and father which i think may have you know is sort of spirally linked in terms of his developmental trauma and um he just felt like a, a reawakening to life as he put it um, and, you know, he was functioning before, but in a very shut down way. And um, as a clinician in the room, and I'm sh assuming there's some clinicians on the, uh, in this webinar today listening, uh, you know, you know what it's like to work a full day where you're seeing like eight clients in a row and you're sort of zonked at the end of it. It's really both ex like blissfully energizing to do eight hours of MDMA work in one day, but also at the end, I mean, we just... My, Emily and I, we just sort of collapsed at the end and uh, needed to take a little TLC for ourselves because it was so much, uh, so much process that happened so quickly. Uh, and, you know, we did our best, we did our best to integrate it in the subsequent weeks. Uh, but it's really something at the end of a Saturday night, uh, we get to go home and uh, have some tea and uh, read a book or, or fall asleep. So that's, that's part of my experience with it. Yeah, thank you. It's a profound personal involvement, really. Did you have another thought, Alex? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not at this point. I don't know, Richard, if you want to share something or weigh in on about what, what your thoughts are about the nature of this work. I'd be curious to hear. Well, uh, unlike you, Alex, I've not really had the chance to uh, participate in, in therapy that is dispensing the, the actual substance to people in a controlled setting like this, like with the MAPS protocols, which I've seen so very many times. Um, I do, however, uh, help people who come to me who want to process and integrate these kinds of experiences afterwards. So I've worked with several people who have had ayahuasca experiences, and one person who uh, 
has some Asperger's kinds of sim sy symptoms, but is not like fully qualified for this, uh, for the full diagnosis. He uh, was suffering from a lot of self-loathing and he started uh, chewing the salvia divinorum leaves. And surprisingly, it, it really helped him with this. It, it helped him let go of these feelings of self-loathing and to really appreciate himself for the very first time, probably, uh, since he was maybe a, a very small child. And it helped him process a lot of these traumas. And for the people who I've worked with who've tried ayahuasca, it's a, a similar kind of thing. It, it is, well, it's a very different experience, but I mean, the kinds of benefits they end up getting out of it is, um, it feels similar from my side. Um, a lot of relational kinds of issues that people go through uh, end up getting processed. Sometimes people in the ayahuasca experience can become far more empathic and they can kind of see things from the other, pe other person's perspective, people who they may have wronged or they've had severe disagreements with uh, throughout uh, the course of their, their lives. They, they get to see things from a lot of different perspectives and it helps them to, to be more empathic. So, it, 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 so basically if they can integrate these experiences, and I tell people if you're going to have one of these experiences, take a notebook with you and try to write down what your, what your experience is, either during it or shortly thereafter. A lot of times people can't write while, while, during the experience, but shortly thereafter is usually good enough, and try to bring some of that material to the therapy session so that we can talk about it. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of dicey. I can't recommend that anybody does this, but if they do do it all on their own then, and they want to come to someone and process it, then, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to walk them through that process and try to develop something meaningful out of it and they can take with them that doesn't just get lost. And I think this, this is the most important part of, of this work is not merely having the experience and having the insights, but having something that you can take with you uh, in an enduring kind of fashion that doesn't just fade away over time. And it's best, I think, to do this integrative work uh, as soon as possible. I mean, I'm, I've heard many accounts that there's an afterglow effect after a full dose experience. And of course, I've experienced that afterglow effect as well. It can last for days or weeks or even months. Um, Recently, I heard someone say that a one month time window is about what you need to aim for. Like if, if someone has had an experience, try to work on integrating it within one month after you've had the experience so you can turn it into good life habits and good relational kinds of uh, habits towards um, relating to your other fellow human beings and especially people that you, you love, your loved ones. So that's basically what I try to do is um, turn it into something that's more enduring that people can take with them. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to doing your kind of work too, Alex, <laughs> with the expanded access program and everything. That's going to be uh, it's wonderful. Really exciting, isn't it, for yeah. expanded access? Mm -hmm. so, so for people who don't know that there's a large phase three multi-site trial with MDMA, but MAPS is very interested in uh, what's called expanded access, which would be a period, maybe even starting later this year, uh, mm -hmm. before MDMA, if MDMA gets rescheduled or is, uh, or even considered a, a medication for PTSD, there might be a way for, for multiple sites to administer MDMA-assisted psychotherapy through what's called an expanded access model using the same protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm excited that you're uh, starting a site in the Bay Area, Richard. That's that's wonderful. Oh, I'm very excited as well. Yeah, and uh, when I joined the expanded access call, it was absolutely packed full with 100 participants, and that's all I could see. Maybe there was even more than that. So obviously, there's a lot of of therapists and medical doctors out there that are interested in the expanded access program. That much was obvious. So, guys, and yeah, with with all of this research happening, we know that this need for integration is growing. Um, people coming to even traditionally minded therapists to talk about their experiences with their uh, even casual explorations of psychedelics. I'm curious, do you, do you see a future for sanctioned psychedelic research that focuses on the growth potential um, for a spiritual development? You know, a lot of this right now is geared toward 
healing uh, trauma and medical diagnoses. Do you think that there's a future for research, you know, that's geared toward spiritual evolutionary development? Um, I can address part of this. So the FDA is not concerned with this at all. Um, they, they, they're concerned with treating medical and psychiatric disorders. And so that they're not really interested in like self-improvement and spiritual development and wellness beyond the norm, um, like with uh, nootropics or, and, or getting something out of a, a psychedelic experience other than treating PTSD or depression or anxiety or OCD or addiction or something like that. So uh, I don't think the FDA is likely to change their stance on these kinds of things anytime soon. Um, there are other countries where there are communities and centers where you can go and have these experiences. Like for instance, in, in Jamaica, there's a psilocybin um, clinic, I guess you might say, or it's, it's more like a, a wellness center or something where people go and it's residential and you have several psych um, psychedelic experiences with psilocybin. And there's also several churches like Santo Daime and Uniao de Vegetal and the Native American church, which have effectively gained legal access to some of these substances by claiming a religious right to their use. And um, the Santo Daime and Uniao de, de Vegetal use ayahuasca as their sacrament. And by proxy of the Native American church having used mescaline, they were able to um, essentially adapt the same kinds of uh, rights of use uh, for those substances. So you could join Santo Daime and have many wonderful ayahuasca experiences, but I, I would highly recommend learning Portuguese first because all of the services are in Portuguese. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, with the FDA, um, yeah, it, it, I don't know if, like I said before, I don't, I don't see them changing their stance on this anytime soon. But that being said, I, I don't think that exploring spiritual uh, development and evolutionary potential of psychedelics is going to make these substances any less legal than they already are. And it may actually raise some public awareness towards the benefits of using these substances, which over time may end up building some sort of mild pressure uh, towards the FDA and, and let them know that the people that they serve have a different opinion than they do. So. Could I, would it be okay if I just jumped in? Sure. To, um, so um, I wanted to make two points. One, just sort of the harm reductionist in me to sort of speak out a little bit with regards to um, uh, seeking out uh, psychedelic uh, retreats or ceremonies. You know, I think it's really important um, to remember for everybody out there, I know, I know you know this, Richard, but for people who may be listening, that there is no regulations, there are no regulations around these centers. And so, um, for example, the psychedelic program where we do integration work, we have a rule that one, we don't connect anybody to underground psychedelic therapy, but we also don't refer to, um, to, to retreats or clinics, um, even if they were legal outside of the country, because as a mental health professional, right, we have an ethical kind of standard to um, well, care for the people who, re who reach out to us. Um, and there's a way where we can't be certain about the quality of care that's provided at these retreats. Often, um, there are no mental health professionals uh, there. So if somebody's seeking this out for um, to treat some psychiatric um, issue or experience, I think there's this uh, level of risk that uh, people are taking on when they go to seek out a retreat. But for some people, that risk may be, it may be worth it to them personally to do that. Um, but it's, so it's difficult because, you know, we, I even, we even have examples of places that at one point um, had very high quality care when they started a, a retreat. And then uh, over time, the quality of the services that they provided declined because of the amount of interest in it. And again, no sort of uh, oversight around what was actually being doing in, in what is what was being provided at these these centers um although there are um you know not to say that uh, there are people um who run these centers who care extremely deeply about what uh about who they who visits and the care that they uh and the services they provide um the second thing i just wanted to, to also mention was the question that um you had raised uh katrina which is um 
uh, sort of the medical perspective or treating uh, something a psychiatric or medical issue versus uh, enhancement of well-being. And I uh, um, and you had mentioned the word research, and so I think uh, we have to sort of tangle. Uh, detangle this a little bit. One, um, you know, there are research studies that are looking at um, more than just treating uh, or beyond treating a psychiatric illness. Uh, there's a study looking at psilocybin and um, uh, experienced meditators. We have the, some of the studies that Alex had mentioned, including the um, uh, religious professionals. I believe that there's a study looking at, uh, in the works or already started, looking at um, uh, a single microdose in the enhancement of creativity, I believe, run by the Beckley Foundation. Um, so these are, as, as Alex, uh, healthy humans, <laughs> um, as much as we are healthy, all, are all healthy. Um, but um, but but the, the sort of the the implied question I think that you had, uh, Katrina, was okay. Well, what about the future of um, uh, psychedelics for the enhancement of well-being? Um, for uh, outside of a clinical context. And I think that's where what Richard had mentioned is, is absolutely true, that um, it's, it, you know, my personal belief is that that could be a possibility in the future, but I think the, the roadmap to getting there um, is uh, not exactly clear. I'll, I'll, uh... I mean, I think that to address the question of what's the future of spiritually transformative experiences as occasioned or invited by psychedelic medicine work, we have to, in order to look forward, we have to go back. And so I just want to go back as far as we know in, in, in recorded and pre-recorded history, which is that these medicines were not traditionally given by people with medical degrees or mental health professionals in institutions or academic settings. So if we look to the Kaikion mysteries, which is, this is in the Eleusinian mysteries in Hellenic Greece. This is during the time of Socrates and Pythagoras. These, both of them, and Plato, uh, all three of them were known to be initiates in the Eleusinian mysteries, which is a, a ritualistic mystery cult uh, in the fifth century BCE, where people drank a drink called the Kaikion, which contains psychoactive plants. Uh, we assume they were psychedelic in some way. We don't know exactly what this drink is because it was an esoteric mystery. It was literally a secret, uh, but we know that it existed from multiple accounts. We see this in the Rig Veda in the Hindu Indian tradition, uh, where there are pans in the, one of the oldest written texts to Soma, which brought visions. It's assumed to be a psychedelic plant, and there's a controversy about whether it was it's a type of mushroom or um, ephedra or something else. Uh, we see this in the, the Tura flowers that are in the hair of many statues of Shiva. Uh, the Datura flower is a very powerful psychedelic. Uh, it contains a cholinergic um, that I don't recommend people pursue recreationally lightly. Uh, we see this, of course, um, in uh, multiple other traditions where we have perhaps less of a recorded history the very word shaman comes uh, from the Siberian steppe where um, uh, shamans were giving uh, mushrooms uh, to themselves and other people. Usually uh, the sort of traditional fairy tale red capped mushroom, uh, red mushroom with little white dots, the Amanita muscaria mushroom, which produces psychedelic visions. Although we believe they also used uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which is the mushroom we use in our studies or at least the compound we use, uh, psilocybin. Uh, we have evidence from the Tassili Plain in Northern Africa of cave paintings of uh, bee shaman with multiple mushrooms growing, drawn around them and holding mushrooms in their hands. And that's not to mention the entire lineage in Mexico and in the Yucatan uh, of mushroom use, of stones of mushroom use. This is before the time of Maria Sabina, the Mazatec shamanist, but these these beautiful mushroom stones that were destroyed by the Spanish when they arrived during the time of colonialization. Uh, there's the ancient spiritual religious history of the Aztecs who called mushrooms teonactal in their language. The language is nopatl. My understanding is that teonactl uh, literally translates as flesh of the gods. Uh, we know that they used mushrooms in some sort of spiritual way, uh, and much of this has been lost to time, but we have gold-plated 
sculptures from Peru of mushrooms that are pre uh, before the Spanish that were made before the Spanish arrived. I don't have these. I have these beautiful slides that I'd love to show you sometime. So there's this ancient and archaic history in human civilization of using what we put into our bodies, food, medicine, spiritual plant master teachers in a variety of esoteric, religious, shamanic uh, traditions. Uh, much of this was not written down. Uh, and then with the advent of industrialism, it's just kind of like lost. It's like ignored. We, are, we arrive in post-industrialism and it's not until the 50s or 60s that um, psychiatry starts to look to some of these medicines. You start to have anthropologists going into the jungle and collecting botanical specimens and plants and speaking with local peoples about their use of these medicines. It's become highly um, medicalized in a number of ways. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I don't, I mean, I'm working in that model. I think that uh, we've taken every step and intention to create a, a space where people can do deep spiritually transformative and healing work. And, um, but that's not to say that that's the only type or modality in which this practice could be pursued in the future. And specifically, even though you know the FDA is concerned with symptom reduction and we're sort of working in a symptom reduction model, we want people's depression to go down, we want their PTSD symptoms to go down, we want their anxiety to come down. The mechanism by which this happens, the primary mechanism is believed to be, the mediator is believed to be a mystical experience or what Ingmar called like a, previously a mystical type experience. Uh, this is the, the strongest driver of, whether or not a person's clinical symptoms improve after treatment is whether or not they have a full or complete mystical experience on a questionnaire. And we can debate the meaning of that questionnaire. I have a whole critique around that. Um, but um, because I think it skews towards this type of Advaita, void, emptiness, uh, shunyata experience of what constitutes a, a spiritual experience, when in fact, most of our participants talk about a very a wide tapestry of types of religious, spiritual, profoundly feeling full experiences that they experience as spiritual, um, but are not necessarily um, a quality less experience of the void uh, or, a not, or what we might call a non-dual experience. Some people do claim to have a non-dual experience using psychedelics, but many do not. And yet they uh, looked at these experiences as very powerful, uh, deeply important, and uh, these experiences may be predictive of their uh, uh, betterment and, and uh, improvement in their symptoms. So, yeah, I, I'll just close by saying I think that in the future, uh, if these substances are legalized or if the constraints change around this, we'll see what's happening in the underground uh, that we might start to think critically about how we offer these substances to people and who can carry them and in what ways. I, I would just love to... to um uh, to uh, what Alex had mentioned in the end. Um, one thing I think would be a, maybe a good thing for us to, to just plug, Alex and I actually uh, have submitted a paper and we will be um, hopefully soon to be published uh, looking at something called the post-traumatic growth index, which is essentially uh, a measure, psychological measure looking at um, people or how people report uh, personal benefit from having gone through a very, very difficult uh, traumatic experience. and. What we found in, in our research looking at the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy that the treatment did facilitate this post-traumatic growth. And the thing that's exciting about, to us about it is that it is more than just um, symptom reduction, but actually people talking about benefits, which included the subscale looking at uh, enhanced spirituality, which was found to be significant, but also enhanced relationships with others, greater meaning in, uh, in life. Um, and also to just add, um, and I'm, I really appreciate what Alex you had said about the mystical or the uh, um, state of consciousness questionnaire or the mystical experience questionnaire. Um, the, the MDM, so with the psilocybin research, it does seem like that uh, the greater of the intensity of the mystical experience, that that, that is uh, highly correlated with uh, symptom reduction. Uh, but that same strength of that correlation is not found in the research with, with MDMA. And so, it, but it is significant. So, so the spiritual experience is contributing to improvement, but not as much as in, with the psilocybin findings. And um, I really want to agree with Alex around how we define the mystical experience. And for um, maybe this meant a plot, 
your your listeners are probably aware of this, but I think um, culturally and much more broad, broadly, um, people tend to think about uh, mystical experiences, particularly those occasioned by psychedelics, as being very intensely visual in nature and often kind of um, spectacular. Um, you know, dragons or uh, uh, various kinds of entities or deities. And although that does happen sometimes, um, often, at least through my, um, my opinion, is that it is much more something like a really deeply felt sense of knowing or, a, or an affective connection to what is, what is experienced if it is sort of spectacular in nature. And I think that that is something that um, occurs in the MDMA therapy, in the psilocybin therapy. Uh, and as I think it's a key thing that shouldn't um, be lost when we're talking about spiritual experiences, that it's, it's not just what one sees, but also uh, the experience that one has and um, how that af affects them on a very, very deep level where, where ideas that were previously known intellectually are somehow known differently, embodied in some way. And then that is um, carried forward. Um, Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Ingmar. I think that's a really good point um, to talk about how we distinguish these experiences. And, and I think in general, spiritually transformative experiences are uh, not just vision. There's something else happening that is catalyzing significant shift in somebody's worldview and lifestyle. And, and that brings me to my next question, which is um, about integration. And we touched on it a little bit. But what are you finding in your research um, that is needed for integration? You know, what can we learn from the research that you all are doing right now? Or what, what are your, even, even taking from the integration sessions that you're doing, what can we learn so that we can teach others and apply it ourselves? Um, well, uh, that would require a very long answer. <laughs> there are many answers to that question. And I think one thing that maybe we should mention that um, we haven't really mentioned yet explicitly, that I know that uh, Alex and Richard I are familiar with, is this idea of the inner healing intelligence. We speak about this, or a more well-known maybe um, uh, in just intuition, a kind of intuition. And so uh, with I believe all of these kinds of therapies, if they're in research, but also particularly in the integ integration process, um, we highlight, or at least um, I think I can speak for us, but I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I highlight um, the importance of one one's own intuition. That that as facilitators or therapists, we are not the experts that are telling or interpreting um, a person's uh, spiritual experience, but rather to relate um, for for the the client or participant to be able to relate to their own internal world, um, to be able to understand that there's a voice or con con uh, conscience or uh, something inside that is actually um, themselves. And it's another way of relating to oneself in which um, knowledge and guidance can um, be generated. Uh, and uh, the integration process, I think, in my work is very much about teaching that idea and really supporting uh, a client's self-driven um, uh, 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 work. And I'll add that sometimes I think when um, people come in having a difficult or having had a difficult experience, uh, it can sometimes be due to um, a lack of understanding in that. And I'll illustrate that with one case in which um, a person went down to who I treated went down to um, uh, Peru, had an ayahuasca experience. I had I had not met her at that point yet, uh, and she had a great deal of social anxiety and very very low self esteem. And during her ayahuasca experience, uh, what she had heard repeated over and over and over again for six hours was this voice saying, "You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid." Just over and over and over again, and. Um, she then was uh, welcomed to share in an integration circle in uh, Peru, but didn't she? She was so ashamed um, uh, that she wasn't. She didn't share that with anybody, and she kind of held on to that that for several months until she became more depressed. She became suicidal, um, or had suicidal ideation, 
And luckily she uh, was connected with me and we were able to sort of understand who, like what was that voice about? And this idea of possibly that voice being, uh, we also talk about a non-specific amplifier. So this idea that feeling states or thoughts on a psychedelic can be amplified to a, a very, very powerful degree. And that, uh, that perhaps one way of looking at that experience was that her, that voice, that self-critical voice that she carried with her was just amplified and sort of personified in the ayahuasca experience. And that actually, although that was very difficult for her, that allowed her in the integration process to re-relate to um, that, that voice and uh, uh, to, to make a, long, <laughs> a longer treatment short, um, you know, she was really able to, that, that was a catalyst for her. It really was to make a turnaround in her life. Great, thank you. Uh, Alex or Richard, any thoughts on integration before we move on to questions from the audience? I'll I'll uh, say a few things. I, I think that we like barely know anything about it is what, is what I'd like to start. I mean, I think some people do really fantastic integration work, but um, I my sense is that both as researchers and clinicians, we're still doing our best to understand these various trajectories. Um, you know, in the some of the controversies in the psychedelic research communities around um, people having really profound experiences in the moment and then uh, you know, altered states, uh, but not having altered traits, you know, that, that they have these experiences and then the memory phase, state dependent memory, it's almost like a dream. Uh, and within a week, people are back in their same behavioral patterns or they don't integrate in the sense that they don't uh, take an opportunity to potentially change their behaviors, their way of thinking of themselves, their depressive ruminant cycles, that they are not integrated literally in communities or holding circles where people use the medicine. So in the Santo Daime Church, there's a circle of people that are working together on a regular basis, at least once a month, maybe twice a month. Um, but in the West, oftentimes we have these like solo people who may travel and do an ayahuasca circle, but have no religious or spiritual framework in which to make sense of their experience, and then may not be integrated into a kin network or a, a journey practitioner group, or even with their therapist who may not have a sense of what the meaning is for this. And so oftentimes they're left without a basic structure in which to make sense of the experience, which can be quite uh, challenging to people's uh, basic eschatological understandings. Um, so what I think needs to be done is for us to think about how to embed these practices. And so these are not medications that are just gonna be prescribed. They'll probably be offered in centers. Um, and the sort of like fly in and fly out model is a little problematic. So uh, we, we frequently get people who have, it's most problematic I think when people have difficult or bad trips, uh, the sort of, um, there's a lot of scare literature about bad trips, bad LSD trips, and we hear horror stories of people doing terribly dangerous things to themselves. We know from the actual medical literature that psychedelics are actually quite safe. Um, it's very difficult, it's almost impossible to overdose from them. And in uh, a supportive context, like we see at places like Hopkins and in the MDMA trials and at NYU and at UCLA and Imperial College, there are no serious adverse events, there's no hospitalizations people do experience transient anxiety, even panic, sometimes what we call thought disorder, they're, they're not making sense uh, if they speak. Um, but all of these are transient and are well resolved within the therapy because of the supportive bond of trust and alliance with the therapist. We frequently hear that from the patients that they were freaking out, they were having a lot of momentary panic, uh, even paranoia, but they felt safe enough in the room that this was actually not, um, I call this with the psychedelics, like we're afraid of the bad trip, but it's not, I actually think that this is not a bug of the experience, that it causes these experiences. It's oftentimes the person having a confrontation with unprocessed shadow work, or we can use a different type of experience. They're having a confrontation with the self, they're having a confrontation with basic fear and anxiety about being a human, which has long been suppressed, avoided, dissociated out. They may be uh, encountering age-old traumas from their childhood or from their life. And um, 
that is not necessarily a problem. The problem is how, do, how is that process? So it's not a bug, it's a feature if we can support them. But I think what I imagine what Richard and Ingmar and I have been seeing is oftentimes we see casualties from unregulated underground settings where I think beautiful work can and does happen, but oftentimes people don't have a support structure in place. They don't have an integration framework either internally or externally. And so they come to us. Uh, I treated a young man who had a variety of very disturbing LSD trips and he was struggling with his sexuality. This was years ago. Uh, and he would take LSD like and just walk around Manhattan. It's a, it's a terrible, like completely non ideal setting in which to do this work. And he would come to, he came to me afterward and was struggling with this idea that he was attracted to men and the, the profound shame, the profound self hatred that he was experiencing in a closeted family, closeted with his friends, unable to tell his girlfriend was so overwhelming that it became problematic for him. And so we worked on it in integration, but it would be better if, of course, if as a culture we had a way in which people could approach these in a less harmful, uh, approach these substances with reverence and with um, supportive structures uh, that was potentially less harmful for them. Uh, so that when these uh, spiritually transforming experiences arose, um, that they were potentially less threatening in the moment and better integrated uh, on that day. Yeah, absolutely well said. And hopefully that's what we're all building together just by having this conversation. Um, Richard, any, any thoughts briefly on integration? And then I have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I think the other two pretty much said it all. Um, I could say just a few more pieces here. Um, first of all, yeah, yeah the, these retreats do have an inconsistent quality of care. And this is one of the unfortunate consequences of these drugs being um illegal you know and uh, basically it forces people who want to have profound experiences and work on themselves spiritually to go underground and to participate in black markets and um, underground retreats and things like that uh i have heard so many cases of people who have suffered at the hands of uh some of these psychedelic gurus who have risen to fame and then they get caught in um uh, scandals you know like um sexually abusing their their clients or things like this during these experiences and it's just um it's really disappointing that um people who would try to be ferreting other people through this process could misuse their power in this in this way and so one of the things I'm definitely looking forward to, and I'm sure Ingmar and Alex are as well, is, is a day when it is legal enough to be regulated. And so there, there are rules and may, maybe some sort of supervision process and licensing structures for these various retreats where people could go and have what the FDA would probably consider to be nothing more than a recreational experience, but which other people would consider to be deeply profound and, and spiritual. And that's the reason why they, they go to these retreats. It's, it's generally not to have a good time or anything like that. Um, psychedelics can be quite challenging. And um, uh, so, I, I mean, I think most people going into these, these retreats know this ahead of time and, and they're wanting to process deep personal material. And, you know, back to the, the question of integration, um, I think it's important to focus on with your clients uh, the pieces that were challenging, the pieces that were brought up where, uh, like Alex said, uh, when you're forced to confront yourself, because in many ways, that's what these experiences are. You are confronting yourself and especially those aspects of yourself that are getting in the way of happiness. And there seems to actually be a, an inner healing quality that is probably always activated, but it's, it's you know, I think in the society that we have grown up in, it, it, it winds up being suppressed in many ways. So the, the psychedelic experience can reactivate that and show you directly, like, look, this is what's getting in the way of your ongoing happiness. And that you have to deal with this and what you know now is a perfect time for that so um that can be challenging if the if the material is is, is very difficult if you're holding on to a lot of attachments and a lot of perhaps bitterness or resentment or things like this all of those things are going to get um targeted by, by these experiences and um 
part of the process is letting go of these things. And it's true that if you don't integrate the experience properly, you're going to redevelop attachments back to your, your old, um, your old ways of thinking, your, 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 your bitterness and resentment or whatever kinds of struggles you're going through, your traumas and things like this. So it, it's not just something you can do in a single session or anything. I, I think like um, therapeutically speaking, this is, this is going to take many sessions, just like um, with the MAPS protocol. There's uh, a, a few integration sessions in between the experimental sessions. I don't know for sure that three is enough, but you know, for, for research purposes, that, that's, that's good enough for the FDA. Um, in other kinds of settings and with, with different uh, needs uh, for different clients um, and people, it could take like maybe six, seven sessions. It, it could take a whole year, who knows? I mean, some of these experiences are truly transpersonal and um, they're, they are, beyond the typical framework of conceptual thinking. I mean, um, the first line of the Tao Te Ching comes to mind. Uh, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the eternal Tao. So a lot of these things are very, very difficult to wrap your mind around. And um, when you get into the deeper levels of the, the, the mystical experience, however we want to define it, and I do appreciate the discussions that have come up here about like what exactly is the mystical experience, and that's like a huge subject that is would take hours and hours to unpack. But um, I, I do think that there are levels to the experience and there's something that's at the, the deeper levels as well, uh, which I think is a, a very unitive sense of connection to everything, like realizing you are the only being that's ever existed and, um, and that you have a timeless quality to yourself. So there's all, all of these things are uh, pretty hard to integrate because uh, it's just very not human, you know, in a sense. And our, our culture does not support these kinds of things. You're not supposed to be thinking about these things. You're supposed to be watching your football and drinking your beer, right? Isn't that right? So um, I, I, I do feel that um, finding a good sense of community with people who can understand and respect these kinds of experiences is critically important for the integration process as well. Because if you just go straight back into the culture that put you in this situation in the first place, you're gonna get re-traumatized again and you're, you're not going to integrate properly. You're gonna basically regrow the same kinds of connections and attachments that you had before that were getting in the way of your happiness originally. So, um, Luckily, there are these communities. You can find them online. You can go to a conference and find other people of like mind. Uh, there's lots of psychedelic conferences these days. So uh, I would highly recommend that people find these communities. And of course, Assist is one of these communities now, right? So, um, and I'm, I'm glad that Assist is, is, is very understanding towards these kinds of experiences, whether they're psychedelic or not. So yeah, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the things that we really want to do better. And you know, there may be a need for more research, even so we can train uh, therapists and coaches mm -hmm. who are encountering people taking these, mm -hmm. you know, excursions with plant medicine and whatnot, so that we we can know how to help them integrate when they come back and they don't have resources or community. So I'd like to see more research there. But okay, just a couple of quick questions before we wrap in a few minutes. Um, so. Alex, this is specifically for you. What are the specific th psychotherapeutic interventions that you are applying both in MDMA sessions and in post-session processing for integration? You can do your best to answer that briefly. Yeah, you've, you've landed right on the question or you landed right on the uh, basic controversy among people who are theoretically oriented in this community. So, um, as Ingmar pointed out, and just, 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 I think it'll be more interesting to talk about the controversy about what type of therapy do you use both during the, the medicine session with either MDMA or psilocybin or ketamine um, and also before and after. Um, the basic model has been something that's uh, in the MDMA sessions and it's sort of similar in psilocybin uh, advocated by Dr. Michael Mithoffer and, and Andy Mithoffer and also Bill Richards is this idea of a sort of uh, uh, let the patients, uh, it's an interdirected process 
where you invite the patient to access their inner healer or their inner healing intelligence. And the role of the therapist is basically to sort of like support the process, but, um, uh, but not to, you know, do like strong directive interventions. Uh, our training also involves, is, is largely informed by work with holotropic breath work, which was advanced by Dr. Stan Groff, which involves breathing very heavily. Um, there's driving music, like loud, strong music in, in the room usually, and people are, are invited to close their eyes and go inward. But the therapist from breath work, we use some aspects of Hakomi therapy, which might involve touching the therapist, holding the therapist, even letting the, excuse me, touching the, the client, holding the client, letting the client press against us if they're feeling rageful or working through something. Um, so we negotiate consent with physical touch ahead of time. Theoretically, it's kind of open whether we're dealing with a transpersonal theoretical orientation, a psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapeutic orientation. Um, my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Gus, is a psychoanalyst in New York, and a lot of the NYU work is more psychodynamically informed with psilocybin, uh, looking at transference and countertransference matrices between uh, the individual, the client and the two therapists, but also the client's transferences toward the medicine. Is it good medicine that's going to help and save me? Is it potentially neutral or bad medicine that might be out to get me? All of that is considered. And then in a lot of the addiction trials, the psilocybin trials, this is addiction for alcohol uh, with Dr. Michael Bogan shoots at NYU, but also uh, smoking secession, uh, nicotine quitting, um, smoking quitting programs at Hopkins and cocaine down in Alabama. These are mostly CBT protocols. So they're either CBT where the quit date is the first dosing date with the medicine, or now more and more so these are ACT protocols, acceptance and commitment therapy protocols, uh, where a lot of the preparatory and integration work is based upon uh, the client's sense of meaning. So it's sort of like CBT married with a, a mindfulness protocol about having a non-judgmental, present-focused awareness of what's coming up uh, in the session. So there's quite a few different orientations. And the other level of this is that most of the work we do in the United States is sort of the psychedelic dosage level. So people that are having strong, often mystical type experiences. But there's also a whole psycholytic level where it's like lower dose, where people may be talking, are able to talk and do psychotherapy during the session. So psycholytic ketamine, psycholytic MDMA, people's defense structures are lowered uh, and they may have access to a different way of speaking. So in Europe, there's a long history of lower dose work where people are actually doing talk therapy during the session. Um, I mean, certainly people can talk during a higher dose session, but the, the nature of the work changes because they're more in the room uh, and at lower to moderate doses than they are at moderate to high doses. And so I think the jury is still out on what is the best theoretical orientation. We'll see what happens uh, in the next couple of decades. I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that, but that's my basic sense of the landscape. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, and then just really quickly, um, somebody wants to know what conclusions we've arrived at from some of the studies with clinical depression. Can somebody speak to that? Um, I, I can a little bit, sorry, but uh, for, for the depression outcome, so the, the big news is that the question is like psychedelic therapy is a treatment in search of an indication. What should we use it for? Should it be anxiety, existential distress, major depression, treatment resistant, treatment refractory depression, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder? The leading indication right now is in both Europe and the United States for psilocybin is depression. In the United States, a large phase two trial is looking at depression. Uh, in Europe, it's treatment resistant depression. Uh, and actually, there's going to be another phase three trial in the United States with treatment-resistant depression. The findings are pretty promising with depression. So in our study of cancer patients, uh, we treated 29 subjects. For the subjects with depression versus placebo, this is a randomized control trial, uh, their uh, response rate was 83%. A significant reduction in their depression severity as compared to only 14 percent and that 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 rate which is an incredibly high response rate you don't see this with other SSRIs I mean it's the response rate is two to three times what you would see in other studies 
And that was after one psilocybin session, that response to depression was sustained at six and a half month follow-up. So they're only getting one psilocybin and then integrative therapy afterward, but they're still getting 60 to 80% response rates in long-term follow-up after one, one medication session. Um, and the Lancet Psychiatry did a study with LSD. This is uh, at Imperial College, looking at people who had failed multiple modalities with SSRIs and SNRIs in previous CBT or talk therapy for depression. Uh, and they found that um, very strong response rates. Uh, and um, uh, I think over half of the sample remitted from depression uh, entirely, um, which is not to say it's a cure-all or a panacea, but it certainly has a stronger effect size. So we significantly receive lar very large magnitude effect sizes with depression, but also with anxiety and also in the PTSD trauma domain. And I'd like to just add to this that, um, you know, what's curious about all of, all of this work um, is that, uh, you know, we're not necessarily talking about, if we're talking about psilocybin or MDMA, we're not talking about an antidepressant, we're not talking about an anxiolytic or an anti-addictive medication or an anti, you know, it's, it's curious, why is it that psilocybin seems to be, at least in the trial so far, helpful for depression, um, addiction issues, uh, anxiety related to terminal cancer? We, we, we could assume that taking a very overtly overly biological model that we just happen to be hitting the right part of the brain that is sort of responsible for all of these somewhat kind of di divergent um, uh, issues. Or we could think about certainly something is going on biologically, but perhaps the experiences uh, facilitated by uh, psilocybin and MDMA may actually be um, getting at some of the, uh, the underpinnings of, uh, of that are sort of at the basis of, of uh, of, of these express the symptoms that are being expressed uh, and so I think it's important to think about um, this this work in that way the, what is the ideology of depression and is it uh, are we simply sort of doing something that is targeting symptoms or are we doing something that may be getting at uh, what is expressing uh, symptoms yeah great great questions and um promising research, so we'll see where we go. Um, and gentlemen, where where can people go if they have interest in getting involved in clinical studies? Is there anything that you're recruiting for or you're aware of right now? Um, so maybe I could speak to this. Um, so uh, currently uh, MAPS is uh, looking to, so it depends on who we're talking about. For, for clinicians who wanna be involved, uh, MAPS is training, um, and we'll continue to train over the next several years, uh, and well, and probably well beyond that. Um, uh, therapists who are looking to be involved in uh, the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD in um, expanded access that was mentioned earlier and, and beyond. Uh, in particular, people who have access to a facility and also a psychiatrist who can obtain a Schedule One license, that's very important in this work. In order to, to um, get more information that people can go to maps.org or search Google for maps.org uh, and also in the word, put in the word participate and that will guide an individual to, um, to, and that also applies for people who may be seeking, who may want to participate in, in research as a, as a participant. Um, they can also go to maps. Um, org in this way. I believe hefter.org also has avenues for uh, uh, participants. Um, another excellent resource, and that was for psilocybin, I should mention. Another excellent resource that people are not uh, so aware of is uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which is, uh, so in brief, when um, a study uh, is uh, launched, uh, it has to be, it's documented and recorded immediately on clinicaltrials.gov. And that, it actually, that website functions as a search engine. So a person could input um, the, uh, the diagnosis, say depression, they could also input the keyword psilocybin, and then they will uh, obtain a list of all of different sites in the United States that are doing uh, that research, which also includes uh, contact information for uh, uh, recruitment. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks, gentlemen, for being with us today and sharing your bodies of knowledge. I hope that we can have at least a couple of you pre presenting your research at our conference coming up in Atlanta in November. Please consider it. I think it would be really wonderful for us to 
make more people aware of the work that you're doing and talk about how we can meet the integration needs of experiencers. Um, so for those that are interested in finding out more about ASSIST and the work we're doing, please take a look at our website. It's assist.org, that's A-C-I-S-T-E dot O-R-G. And again, save the date for our conference in Atlanta, 2019, November 14 to 16. We'll be opening up registration for that soon. And we have extended um, the deadline for people who are interested in presenting their research. So if you're interested, you can write to us uh, for more information with what you're interested on in presenting at info at assist.org. So thanks again, everyone, for being with us. And um, thank you to the audience for staying with us live. And uh, we look forward to continuing in the conversation again. And Elizabeth, I know you're coughing over there. but <laughs> Thanks for helping with the tech today. All right. Thank All right. you, Elizabeth. Thank yes. you, Katrina, for having us. Great. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you.